All right, everybody, we're going to talk about the exam. Basically, how to get started, how to get sorted, how to get organized, and what to sort of expect. My uh, first recommendation is that you go on ART.org and you print off the ART content specifications for the exam. It's essentially a study guide. They're giving you a study guide on what they could possibly ask you for on the boards. It will be 220 questions total. 20 of those questions will count towards your um, final percentage. They are scaled, so they're not all the same um, points. They're all not each a half a point. Um, it also doesn't tell you that when you're taking the test or when you're answering that specific question, you won't know how much it's worth. There are 20 pilot questions every year. Um, they're sort of test questions that they're trialing out for the next few years. And then those are not graded, but they're also not marked. So you won't know which are the pilot questions and which aren't. So you have to answer the 220 no matter what. You have three and a half hours to take the exam. A 75 or higher is a pass. Three tries um, allowed. The first attempt must be within one year of graduation. So I don't want you to wait. I recommend doing it sooner rather than later. And you just will forget things the farther out you go. But if you're not confident, don't take it. Come see me. All right. All right. So you all are going to go to ART, print out your content specifications. This is sort of what it looks like here on the first page of it. Here's the link. Go do it. It's literally going to tell you the breakdown. And I think I have that on my next page here. Yeah. So it breaks down the section and number of scored points. So patient care is only one section. Uh, that's 33 questions. Safety is broken up into two sections. So the physics and rad biology will be 22. Rad protection will be 31 with a total of 53 questions. Image production is broken up into the image acquisition and technical evaluation, 21 questions. Equipment operation and quality assurance uh, is 29, totaling 50 questions. Procedures is your biggest section. Uh, there's head, spine, and pelvis, which is going to be 18. Thorax and abdomen, which is going to be 21. And extremities is 25. So that totals your 64. Total to 200, you have 20 pilots. So 220 is will you be, and you have to answer the full 220. Patient care, of your 33 questions, and in your content specs, it will specify these. So if you go through the pages, your first section is patient care. It will break it down by topic, what's underneath those topics, what's considered. So I have a few examples here. Ethics and legal, what's involved in that, the patient rights, consent, um, legal issues. You need to know all of these terms Okay, make sure you know your common terminology. Interpersonal communications, that's verbal, nonverbal, written, language barriers, explanation of medical terms, patient education, um, post-exam explanations, physical assistance and monitoring, patient transfer, vital signs, all that stuff. Emergencies, your reactions, uh, types of shock, trauma, that kind of stuff. Infection control, know your cycle of infection, CDC standards, your precaution types, handling and disposal of toxic matter. So how would you dispose of chemicals? How would you dispose of chemotherapy? And your safety data sheet or your MSDS. That's where we track all the information on what cleaners we have and their cleaning time and all that sort of stuff. And then pharmacology is your venipuncture, patient history, contrast media, types, lab values, all that sort of stuff. Safety. Safety is two sections. There's the RAD physics and biology, and that contains the radiation physics, so your target interactions, x-ray production, wave length and frequency, do you know the difference between quality and quantity of the beam, inverse square law, interactions with matter. Just remember the interactions in the tube 
and the interactions with matter are separate, right? Um, attenuation, and that will vary by tissue or thickness type. Biological aspects of radiation, do you know the SI units? And SI units um, are what the boards is using. So make sure you know um, your sieverts, your gray, and um, those type of things, okay? Your NCRP chart, know that. Radiation protection, these are usually self-explanatory, a lot of times common sense, and you know more than you think, and you use them a lot. It's just the background or the technical part of it that you might not know. So thinking about how you use your exposure factors, uh, what type of shielding do you use, beam restriction, filtration. When you're using fluoroscopy, are you using the mag mode? Are you magnified up? What does that do to your patient dose? Do you know what air camera is? What is the advantage of last image hold during fluoro versus taking an actual exposure? And then personnel protection or personnel exposure. And that's you guys. Um, so scatter, cardinal rules, your time distance shielding, the NCRP. Do you know mobile versus stationary guidelines, um, dosimeters? Do you know what exposure you are allowed to get as a technologist? Do you know the student tech limit? Uh, do you know the embryo or fetus limit, dose equivalents? What can the public be exposed to, right? So make sure you review those. Equipment and image production, uh, that's again split into two sections. So equipment operation, quality assurance, quality control stuff. Um, so essentially that's all your equipment and your imaging display and processing. My, one of my tips for equipment is for say the x-ray tube or the circuit or the image intensifier. Do you know where the part lives? What order does it go in? Each piece has a job. Do you know what its job is? And do you know what it's the material that it's made out of? Can you tell me what the um, anode is made of? Can you tell me what, you know, the image intensifier, the input phosphor is made out of? Can you do a drag and drop of the circuit? Could you drag and drop pieces in order? Can you draw the circuit? Can you drag and drop and order the image intensifier? What the um, radiation beam goes through in order after it exits the patient and hits the image intensifier. Could you do that? Could you select all of that apply? Those sort of options, all right? The second section is the image acquisition and technical evaluation portion. This is gonna involve that factor chart, the increase or decrease, um, and we'll go through that chart in a second. Technique charts, your type, fixed variable, et cetera, AEC, digital imaging characteristics and image identification. My imaging tips, know the chart. More importantly, what factors affect each other? Is it a direct relationship, indirect? Meaning if you increase one, will it increase something else or will it decrease? Is it an inverse or direct relationship? I'm gonna flip to that um, page in a few seconds and I'll show you that. But Imaging equipment it will be listed on your content specs. Know it, go through it. Go through each thing on that listed on that content specs. I would make a little code for yourself. If you know it, you know it forwards, backwards, cross it out. You're worried about it, you're nervous about it, you're unsure if you know it and you need to study it, circle it, highlight it, make a star, whatever works for you. Um, and that is where you're gonna get started. If you're unsure if you know it, it's better to review it. Okay, go through each thing, each option, and make sure you know it, okay? The image processing, do you know all this terminology, this digital terminology? Do you know how the image is processed? Do you know the post-processing? Can you tell the difference between cropping and masking, brightness and contrast? Uh, do you know the terminology abbreviated, ROI versus VOI? Do you know what the LUT is, the lookup table? Do you know these abbreviations here? DICOM, PAX, RIS, HIS, EMR? Do you know what those are? If not, make it your study session. All right, imaging. Technique charts, fixed or variable, what does that mean? That usually is asking you, is the KVP 
fixed or is the KVP variable? And hint, hint, it's in the word, right? A fixed KVP chart has a fixed KVP, not rocket science. Uh, AEC, do you know where your AEC lives? Do you know what it does? How is it set? Um, how does it turn off, right? What does it change? What's the main primary goal of AEC? Digital imaging, can you define these terms? Can you define spatial resolution? Can you find um, a few examples of how to improve or decrease spatial resolution? Pixel characteristics, do you know what pixel is defined as? DEL, detector element, uh, you wanna know size, pitch, and fill factor, matrix size. Do you know what happens when you do the sampling frequency? Contrast resolution, which is, uh, this is the equipment related one, not the subject contrast, don't confuse the two. Um, bit depth, do you know where your MTF and DQE are and how they're involved? Signal, can you decipher between this terminology? Dynamic range, quantum model, signal to noise ratio, contrast to noise ratio, do you know the difference? And then image identifications, methods, legal, considerations. How are you identifying your image? What is required on the image? That kind of stuff. Here's the chart and this chart is in your content specs. This is the chart that I'd love for you to rewrite. Make a chart. Make a chart in say Microsoft Word or a Google Doc or simply write it out um, handwritten. Okay. If you know what the factors affect, you can essentially answer any imaging question based off of technical factors, okay? MAS only plays for one team. The MAS only plays for receptor exposure. It doesn't play on any of the other teams. It's not friends with anybody else. These ones that only play on one team, those are the easiest to remember, right? If you know MAS and receptor exposure, put them in their own sort of sideline here. Focal spot size. Spatial resolution is the only team that it plays for. The boards, and I'm sure any of your tests, love to put this stuff in to sort of make you question yourself as a distractor. So if it's asking you which of the following affects receptor exposure, it's gonna list multiple of these things. If you know that MAS only plays with the receptor exposure, then you know that MAS only has one option. If it's asking you about contrast, well, what plays on the contrast field? Can you figure out how many of these play for contrast? There's more than you think. Distortion has a little bit less, but so this chart will tell you if it plays well together or if it affects each other. It doesn't tell you if you increase MAS, will it increase receptor exposure? Is it a direct relationship? And that's what I want you guys to really work out. Knowing this chart is great, but knowing the how and the why of the chart is more important than anything else. So write yourself a sentence. MAS, has what effect on receptor exposure? What type of relationship is it? Is it a direct relationship? Is it an indirect relationship? Okay, it's a direct relationship. So that means if I increase my MAS, I increase my receptor exposure. If I decrease my MAS, I decrease my receptor exposure. The more you break it down small, the more like you are to remember it. Let's take, um, let's take grids. Grids affect receptor exposure and contrast. It doesn't tell us if it increases or decreases either, so we have to figure that out. So let's start with receptor exposure. What effect do grids have on receptor exposure? If I increase my grid ratio, I go from a 10 to one to a 16 to one grid ratio. We're throwing an example out here. Will that increase my receptor exposure or will it decrease my receptor exposure? If I increase my grid ratio, 
what does that mean I have in my grid? I have more grid lines. More grid lines is more efficient. More grid lines blocks more from getting to my image receptor. So increasing grid ratio will actually decrease receptor exposure because there's less getting through the patient, through the grid, to my image receptor. So that's an inverse relationship. If you go to contrast, one of the tricky things about contrast, which you have to remember, is that there's the high contrast and low contrast options. Um, and remember, high and low are a little bit different sometimes than what you think. But remember, low contrast is a lot of gray. Usually means there's a good amount of scatter. What do, what's the point of grids? What's their main goal? To absorb scatter. They're gonna increase or improve your image contrast. So what I'd like for everybody to do is break down. Not only can you put the check marks in the spots, why are the check marks in the spots? And is it increase or decrease? If you can answer that for all of these, you can answer any imaging question. Standard definitions. This is on attachment C in the content specs. They want you to know it. It's in the content specs for a reason. So do yourself a favor, make a flashcard of all the terms, make a flashcard of the definitions. They separated computed radi radiography and direct radiography, CRDR, make sure you know the difference. There's um, spatial resolution, receptor exposure, brightness. Notice that receptor exposure and brightness are two different things. If you were taught that brightness is a replacement of image density, you need to review that and go back to that. They separate out contrast into, and then they have grayscales, long and short. Know those, make cards for all of those. Dynamic range, receptor contrast, they have contrast resolution here in bold and quantization in bold. They want you to know those. Pay attention to those. Exposure latitude and then subject contrast. The board separates out subject contrast and receptor contrast or digital imaging contrast. They play on two different teams. They don't attach them together. All right, positioning or procedures as it's listed in the content specs has multiple possible topics, All right? It could be um, any of these positioning ones. It could be landmarks, body position, or projection. So remember projection is the path that the beam takes. Is it an AP, is it PA? Um, immobilization devices versus restraints. Do you know the difference? Can you tell the difference? Respiration, what, is it a orthostatic breathing? Is it inspiration, is it expiration for a reason? Procedure adaptations, would you have to change your centering due to a body habitus? Um, sometimes I think that would be for abdomen related things and usually it's the gallbladder that they're asking about because the gallbladder changes location by body habitus. Also the shape of the stomach. The BMI, Trauma. Trauma is usually a reverse angle um, because if you normally shoot caudal PA, if they're AP, you're going to shoot cephalad, something like that. Do you know your pathology? Do you know the additive versus destructive pathologies? Could you pick it out by definition? Age. Would you make adjustments for pediatric versus geriatric? Um, if they have limited mobility, how would you modify anatomy? I can't stress anatomy enough. There's gonna be a good amount of anatomy on your boards. Just review it, go back, go back to your A&P book. Um, find some games, there's that Purpose Games, which is usually free online, which is a great resource. Play some, play some just anatomy games one day. Do you know your basic medical terms, basic pathology? Could you pick out a pneumothorax or a pleural effusion? Do you know the difference between fluid and air? And I hope at this point you do. Image evaluation, can you look at an image and evaluate it? Or is there proper patient positioning? 
Is there an error with the tube part alignment? Procedures is the largest section. It's 64 out of 200 questions. So don't assume that you know it. Go back and review it. For, there's an attachment, I think it's attachment A, on the content specs. And this breaks down the possible um, exams or views that will be under each section. So head, spine, and pelvis will be 18 questions out of all of these possible um, positions. Thorax, abdomen, which is also procedures, will be 21. Go through those. And then upper and lower extremities is your largest section for the procedures. Those 25 questions. Go through all of those. Okay, go back and review. Textbook. I want you all to go back and look at your textbook. Look at textbook centering at the bottom. Let me, let me back up. Your answers will be textbook on the boards. Something to keep in mind though, is that textbooks may vary. Whether you have Bontrager, whether you have Merrill's, and I can't remember the name of another one at this time, but if the information varies between textbooks, the ART tends not to ask that question. They can, um, but usually if there's a fluctuation between texts, they tend not to ask it. Clinical practice may vary. If you've been at clinical for two years, your texts do something that's not really jiving with the textbook, that's not gonna be on your boards. Just because that's how you've done it for the last two years doesn't mean that that's the correct way or the textbook way, so you have to watch for that. It can help to visualize the resulting image from clinical. If you have a question about a spine, close your eyes, pretend that patient's in front of you, whether you're doing a C-spine or a lumbar spine, you took the x-ray, what does it look on, like on your control panel? What is popping up on the screen? And sometimes that's a confusion for my students because they can't remember lateral C-spine, you see something different than you see on lateral T and L. Are you seeing circles on a lateral C-spine? No, you don't see the circles until you oblique them. But lateral T and lateral L you see the circles, right? Or the foramina, I thought circles, you know what I mean. Uh, external oblique elbow. Would you be able to visualize that oblique? Um, do you know what's supposed to be open? Do you know how to evaluate it? What if there was an internal oblique elbow that we don't do very often at our site? Could you be able to pick that out? Do you know what it's looking for? What the point is? What's the point of an internal oblique elbow? What are you looking for? Go back. I'm asking you guys to go back Dust off your positioning book. Crack it open. Chapter one on our Bontrager has a great anatomy review. There's um, a really great equipment review as well for equipment and imaging. Review some of the method names. The method names may come up. They may ask you about a Jude or a Clements Nakayama or a Judd method. Would you be able to know those? Review also position versus projection and you have to go textbook with it. The evaluation criteria, or I call it the purple box, in all in your textbook on every page where there's a image at the bottom, there's this purple box. There's a lot of magical information in this purple box. It's called the evaluation criteria. It tells you how to evaluate the image or what it's supposed to look like. It tells you how to pick out proper positioning. It tells you how to find rotation. It tells you also how, what it looks like um, for collimation areas. Oh, what is that? Go back, look at it. What is it supposed to look like and how can you tell if it's rotated? All right, here we go again. I'm going to stress the procedures. <laughs> I'm going to stress your procedures section a lot. All right, if you make procedures one of your main goals, it's going to be so much, it's very helpful for you. All right, there's a lot to it. 
but if you can break it into small bites, that's key. So make procedures a start of every section. If you have planned three nights this week, say Monday, Wednesday, Friday, you've planned to study whatever it is, x-ray tube, uh, the NCRP chart, and the circuit, whatever your choices are. You've set aside a few hours, two hours. I recommend only one, but if you want to set aside two, take 20 minutes right before you do your one hour study session on circuits. Pick fingers to elbow. Go through your textbook, look at the anatomy, look at the picture, central rays, degree of oblique, Break it down, break it down smaller if you want to. Look at one, do, do fingers, hand, wrist, then do forearm, elbow, if you wanna break it down even smaller. There's a good amount to procedures. If you look at it as a whole, it can be overwhelming. If you just look at something, something every day, even if it's on your phone, uh, even if it's just a printout of anatomy, like these pictures here, and you wanna look at those once a day, that is great. Some anatomy I want you to know, pelvis. No pelvis in all positions, okay? Know this pelvis anatomy from this angle. Know your carpal tunnel anatomy, okay? Make sure you know this anatomy. Can you pick out the thumb? Can you easily locate the thumb? And if you know what's next to the thumb, and it's easy peasy lemon squeezy. You know the pisiform is gonna be over here. For knee, know the adductor tubercle. Okay, make sure you know those. There are some anatomy also that we just don't do that often. So say Jude views, the oblique pelvises for the inlet and outlet views, pelvis. I'm gonna stress pelvis anatomy a couple more times. Even though we don't do it a lot at clinical, it doesn't mean they can't ask it on the boards. Attachment B, attachment B, they want you to know also, you may think you know these, and I'm sure you do. Take a second, review them. Can you pick out these terms by their definition? This is how they're defining them. Can you separate out view, position, projection? Do you know them by these definitions? Do you know the oblique positions by this wording, would you be able to pick that out? The oblique extremity positions, I want you to go back in your, in your brain to anatomical position. Remember the obliquities for extremities are always from anatomical position. So watch for that. I know you know your obliques, but could you pick those out quickly, these positions? This is showing you a projection. It's showing you the path of the beam. Lateral position. Can you pick out a right and left lateral? I'm sure you can, but it's on there for a reason. Make sure you could pick these out quickly, these obliques. All right. Don't ignore it. It's on there for a reason. Our plan, or my plan. <laughs> you guys are involved. All right, so for a seminar, here's what I do. I break down in this order our study sessions, and then our tests on those areas. So we're gonna do a week of patient care. The following week, you're gonna take 100 question tests on patient care. What do I expect of you in the meantime? I want you to take advantage of everything that's available to you. I made you fill in workbooks. There, you guys have Correct Tech lessons and um, the Rad Tech Bootcamp is available to you as well. Take advantage of that. So we're gonna go through all the sections one at a time. I break up equipment and image production. I think um, as a group, this, is, this tends to be our weaker area. I'm actually, believe it or not, patient care is our weakest area, sadly. I'm not sure why, but I will work on that. Um, I separate out equipment to one test all by itself and then image production, because I love that chart. Um, I want to separate that out by itself. So go through that for me. Then we're going to do a mock test 
at the end of all those, which is a 200 question practice, and then your final exam is a 200 question practice built just like the boards. That is 50% of your grade, but the goal is to pass the board, right? So why not? Rather you screw up on mine than the actual one. I have practice tests for each, each section that you are required to take. Um, I ask that it's you score an 85% or higher on the practice test. Here's what I don't want you to do with the practice test. I, want, I don't want you to just take it five times in a row just to score the 85 and make me happy. I would like you to take the test once, review it. What did I get wrong? First, what was my score? What did I get wrong? Why did I get it wrong? I want you to make a list of the ones that you got wrong. Connect the dots. Are you scoring poorly on a certain topic? Is there a term that you keep screwing up on? This is how we identify the weakness. This is where we identify the area that needs improvement. After that study session of all the things you got wrong, I'd like you to take it a second time. If you don't score in 85 or higher, it might be a weak point. I'd love for you to reach out at that point and be like, hey, I took this two times. I'm still scoring poorly. What can I do? And we'll go from there. Um, but do that for me before the 100 question test. How do I study for boards? I love this saying, how do you eat an elephant? <laughs> There's only one way to eat elephant and that's one bite at a time. Don't look at boards as this big gray rain cloud sitting over your head, like this massive thing that's like the culmination of your two years here. It's a test, it's one test. You've taken a lot of tests up to now. And at the end of my semester here, you are gonna be so well prepared. As long as you give me your all. Give me your 100% and I will give you mine. We're gonna separate out the sections into smaller bites. If you take your content specs, separate it out. Cut it out. Print out some extras. Literally cut out the pieces, cut out the breakdowns, the sections. Make that your plan. Follow the sections in order and you'll be fine. Get a planner. Be realistic in your planner, okay? I don't want you to plan out five hour study sessions every day of the week because you're not gonna do that. And if you do, you're gonna burn out and then your brain's just not gonna fit any more information and then you're gonna melt. So be realistic, write out your work schedule, write out your clinical schedule, class schedule, when do you have classes with me, um, plan that out. Also, give yourself a day. Give yourself a day for your brain to rest. I know you're like, I can't give myself a day. Give yourself a day. Your brain, we're gonna work up. I feel like this is a marathon. We are training for a marathon test here. So we gotta work up to it. Okay, you have to kind of get your brain exercising a little bit at a time here. I also think that two hours max is realistic. For me, I don't do well past 45 minutes. I start to sort of melt and can't retain past 45 minutes of studying. So if that's you, do 45 minutes in the morning, study an area, and then later on at night, do another 45 or don't. Keep it at the 45. You have to do what works for you. If flashcards work with you, stick with flashcards. If you hate flashcards and you like to voice record on your phone, that's excellent. I love those voice recording systems. Um, and then play it. Play it back to yourself. Listen to yourself. If you study, if you write down your answers or if you voice record your answers to these topics in your own words, you're more likely to retain them. Are you artistic? Can you draw the interactions? Can you draw out the tube? Can you draw the skull? Can you draw the anatomy? If that works for you, do it. To my crammers and my procrastinators, I want you to cut it out. 
cramming is not the key. Cramming does not help you retain long term. All of a sudden jumping up and saying, I'm going to run a marathon tomorrow without doing any training is not going to go well. You jumping up and saying, I'm going to cram for two days before I take my boards. It's not going to benefit you in the long run. Okay. So we're going to work up to this marathon run here. All right, how do I divide my study sessions? Well, I'd like to give credit to Meryl here for this picture I have at the top of my screen. And um, she does one-on-one -on -one tutoring for multiple areas of radiology, but sh this was um, an image that she shared. I think it's excellent. Print this out or write out your own. Can you break down the topics into sections do your study sessions, find your weaknesses. When you feel prepared in it, check it off. Check it off, cross it off. Um, just remember some of these sections have smaller subsections to them on the content specs. So that's where she has listed here. Okay, watch for those areas. I want you to be strategic with your studying. Don't sit down and say, I'm gonna study safety today. It's too broad, it's too wide of a range of a study topic for you to actually be benefiting from it. If you wanna, if you wanna focus on safety, then choose something particular from safety. If you are gonna choose biological aspects, study that with say, uh, you can say toes to knee. Choose that one day. Two days later, come back and do personal protection and do femur to pelvis. Okay. I, again, will reiterate that I, I'm a big fan of short, short, organized study sessions. Don't study for six to eight hours in a day. I know it seems like a good plan initially, but in long term, it doesn't help. It doesn't stick. So we're going to start now. Repetition is key, and a lot of this was going to feel repetitive, and it's going to feel like some busy work. Repetition is key. Just trust me on that. We're going to repeat stuff that's important. Flashcards are your friend, especially for procedures. If you haven't made them yet, I recommend it. Unless you hate flashcards, then it doesn't work for you. The key is finding your weaknesses. Be brave. Don't be afraid to be like, I don't understand this. Ask a question. I need you to ask questions. Now's your time to ask questions. The worst thing you could do would be to memorize practice questions. If you have RAD review and you simply memorize all the questions and answers on RAD review, the boards aren't going to be questions exactly cut and paste from your review books or your review, whatever you're using. They might be similar and one or two might be the same, okay? But it is key to passing the boards is understanding the concept of what they're asking. If you can do a study session on a topic and understand the concept, of why this works or why this affects this or why the circuit has to change from volts to kilovolts. If you understand the why, you can answer any question. A problem too is if you've memorized the question, when you go to take your boards, initially the question might look the same. And instead of reading the whole thing, you're like, oh, I know this one. I click the answer but the wording on the board was a little bit different and you chose the wrong answer because you didn't read the question. And I hate when that happens to my students. So please don't just memorize questions. That's not the key to passing, understanding the concepts. Post-test review. This is something I find to be extremely important for finding your weaknesses, which is the key. So after every test you have with me, 
I'm going to ask you to review your tests. Take all your incorrect answers. Take all the questions that you struggled with or debated over answering. Oh, I don't know. Was it A? Was it B? Was it C? I can't. Oh, and the one that you finally picked. Take those type of questions. Write the question out. Write out all the answer options or create a Google Doc and keep a running tally. But I, I love handwriting. I think you retain more that way. But anyways, once you have those written down, I want you to go through each of those questions and ask yourself, why did I choose that answer? And it could be, I had no idea. And just write that down. I had no idea. <laughs> That's okay. Am I confusing terms? Was it a term that you thought meant something else? Highlight that term. Put it on your list. Is it a topic? Is it a whole topic where you're like, oh my God, I don't understand this whole topic. That's a bigger study session than a term, but we're going to identify that. Did you read all the words? Did you read every word of the sentence? Did you read all the answers? Don't, don't click too quickly. Don't read too quickly. Slow it down. Don't let your nerves make you move at this speed where you're not even reading the words of the question. Because I'm going to tell you almost always the answer is in the words of the question. It will lead you to the answer if you slow down and read the words and say, okay, I read this question. What is it asking me? Read all the answers and pay attention because some of them will say, select all that apply or put the answers in order, something like that. Watch for those. All right, take your list. Take your list of wrong answers. Take your list of questions. Take your list of topics. Try and find the common areas. Um, there's usually a mix up of terms, whether it's patient care, those uh, terminology, if it's assault, battery, slander, libel, those, do you know the respondent superior um, versus the other one that I always mess up, res ipsa loquitur, I don't know how to say that. Um, are you messing those up? Are you flip-flopping them? Do you know them? Did you remember them from I don't know, two years ago from when we went over them? All right, so you've got your list of topics, you've got your list of terms, your list of questions that you're like, I have no idea what she's talking about. Plan. Make a plan, plan it out, organize your topics into, I'm going to study this on Monday, I'm going to study this on Tuesday, I'm going to take Wednesday off, study this on Thursday, study something else on Friday, I'm going to take Saturday off, I'm going to do a quick session on, on Sunday, something like that, okay? I want you to ask, I want you to ask all sorts of questions. Ask me, ask Cheryl, ask Dave. You can try and ask the techs, um, but a lot of times, once they have passed their boards, um, a lot of the technical stuff just sort of oozes out their brain. Other than the clinical stuff, um, image-wise, they'll be able to tell you if your image is good or not, but um, the technical stuff, a lot of times, just sort of goes by the wayside. I recommend a Google Doc. Um, is something you can sort of keep a running list of stuff track, questions you're getting wrong, topics, notes, things you want to write down to ask me. Um, sometimes you'll be going through something and you're like, man, I need to ask her that. But by the time you get to me, you forget. Um, or a journal. I'm a big journal fan. Or if you have just a notebook, a spiral notebook or something, start making notes. And don't be afraid. The more you ask, the more you're going to get out of it. And that's the point, right? What's the point of this whole two-year program? The point is to be an excellent technologist and to pass your board's first try. You, if you give me your all, you're not just going to pass. You're going to do amazing. But don't be afraid to ask. Don't be afraid to tell me you don't understand something, because now's the time. A quick thing about exam day, we're going to go over this later in the semester. Um, but so this, you guys are the first year where we're signing up for an ART account via um, that link that was sent to you. On the day of the test, you're gonna have to bring two forms of ID and the names have to match exactly. 
So watch your ID choices. Um, if you have like gotten married in between and um, you haven't changed your name, like don't change anything <laughs> crazy right beforehand. Um, in the past, we needed a passport picture and we had to send that in with the application. I'm not sure if you guys are gonna be required to do that as we're moving to this online system. So I left this on here just in case. Um, but in the past you had to, like you couldn't make any major like hair changes um, in between your passport picture and the day of your test because you had to match exactly. Something I want you to prepare for though is the, the cost of the exam is $200. So I know you guys are students and you might not have a lot of money hanging around, but you're going to want that $200 um, to be able to take your test. And the application process will be starting fairly soon. So by like, I think at least April, you're going to want that money. Uh, once you get um, your test date figured out, um, that you can go on the website you can look at different locations. So you are not, ART is a national certification. So you're not stuck in just testing in Springfield where we are. You can look at other locations near you. You could look around to Connecticut. If there's a date sooner that you want and you wanna take it sooner, there's a specific date you wanna take it on. Um, you can look at other locations. You can take ART, sort of any in the surrounding areas, okay. I recommend taking the tests in the morning. I think you are just more fresh and ready to go and your brain is fresh. Sometimes people are testing at four o'clock at night or eight o'clock at night, but you know yourself best. Is that the best time for you? Do what's best for you. For me, I would have worried and obsessed over it probably all day long. If I had to wait till four o'clock in the afternoon to take my test, I would have died. Um, but do what works for you. Don't study the day before. I know. I tell everybody this. I'm like, what? I swear to God, the day before your marathon run, don't run. <laughs> or don't run a lot. Um, if you want to look at one or two things, fine. But do not study for six to eight hours before you then go in and take essentially a three hour test the next day, let your brain rest. If you don't know it by the day before, you don't know it, okay? Just let it ride. They will fingerprint you. Um, some places do a palm and not just a fingerprint. They're gonna verify your signature. All your belongings are placed in a locker. You can't take them with you. They will check your pockets if you have any. Um, <laughs> they're going to feel like you're giving up your firstborn child to so like go in there. So once they bring you in, they're going to sit you down. There are earphones that you could put on and I recommend that. You don't know what's going on next to you. There's, it's a testing center. So people all around you are going to be probably doing little quirky things. Put the earphones in, zone out. There's an initial screen that pops up. You have two minutes to approve it or you lose your spot and you kind of do another you have to sign up for the whole thing again. Don't miss it because you're like so nervous and you can't even think. Shake it off, hit the approval, and then there's, I believe, a tutorial that walks you through how to do it. I, re I recommend doing the tutorial. I think it settles you down a little bit, shows you how to click stuff, what you'll do, gives you sort of a practice round. Um, so do that. They'll, they will have a whiteboard that you can write on and a white erase marker next to you if you want to jot stuff down when you sit down. The calculator is available on the computer itself. If you have to get up at some point, or even when you're done, you have to raise your hand and wait for them to come get you before you can get up. So don't just pop up and try to leave. Can you go to the bathroom? Yes but your clock is still running as you go. So be watchful of that. Your results, you guys are so lucky, your results will pop up immediately. <laughs> Don't be alarmed. It comes up in red letters, or at least it has up to this point. So just because it's in red doesn't mean that you fail. Um, even if you pass, it's still in red. Do me a favor, take a second, 
let it sink in when you've passed. Of course, we're all going to pass first try. You have to raise your hand to be allowed to stand up and leave. The official results are mailed to you in two to three weeks um, after you receive your passing grade and your ART certificate comes. Then you'll apply for your state license. So Mass license or Connecticut license, wherever you're going to be working, you need um, a state license for there. The mass license information, if you go on mass.gov website and you go to the radiology section, all the applications are listed there. The initial cost for the license is 175. So you might want to plan for that, say June-ish. Um, so watch for that. Okay. I think that's the end of our session.